Good evening, everyone. All right, great. I was hoping those applause are for me, but if they're not, that's okay. That's okay, because I understand this is, a, this is much bigger than me, right? Hello, everyone. My name is Basil Smichael. I am the uh, director of the public policy program here at, uh, at uh, Hunter College, and happy to welcome you to uh, the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute. For those of you who've walked through these doors before, Welcome back, and thank you for your continued support. For all of those first-time guests, how many of you have been here, here for the first time? Wow, okay. Well, let me tell you about Roosevelt House. Um, so you are in the home of the former first family of the United States. This is the former home of uh, uh, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. I would also say it's also home of Sarah Roosevelt. This is technically two mansions that Sarah gifted the young couple upon their wedding. Um, should we all be so lucky to be gifted a mansion? Um, it is technically two mansions because the doting Sarah um, wanted to make sure that she could check up on Franklin from time to time and make sure that everything was going well. We were just in the green room, which is really our sec the second floor library. That is the room uh, that uh, the New Deal was sketched in. Um, it's, it's a really interesting story because in those days the inaugural was in March, not January. So in between the election and the inaugural, uh, the New Deal was sketched out right upstairs. So we like to say here that this is a place of big ideas, um, where big ideas get invented and supported. So thank you for being a part of what we do here. Um, to President Rabb, the president of Hunter College, uh, who could not make it this evening, um, to Harold Holzer, who is the uh, director of the Public Policy Institute overall. Um, we also have, a, by the way, a human rights program out of this that runs out of this building with my colleague Jessica Newberth uh, running that. So to Harold, Jessica, all the folks who have helped us put this together. Danny, who's up there doing the technical pieces of it. Thank you, sir. Thanks for keeping the lights on. Um, <laughs> Peter, uh, Mac, Aaron, Amy Rose, who helped uh, put all of this together, thank you for all of your continued support. You know, as I think about this event and this book, Grace, and we welcome, by the way, Cody Keenan and Ben Rhodes. I think about, as I think about Grace and the title of the book, Grace, President Obama and the 10 Days in the Battle for America, in thinking about the title of this book, I kind of feel like this is the right place and the right time to be talking about grace, isn't it? How do we move forward? How do we think about this moment that we're in in our country? I remember the time in which this text was written or it took place. I remember that as an African-American man, I was saying, boy, Obama's been criticized for being too black by some. He, in some other corners, he was criticized by not being black enough. So this was going to be an incredible tightrope, which I think is a word that's often used in the book, that he would have to walk in being able to address the country in this moment. I remember the time when there was an African-American leading the law enforcement contingent that took down the Confederate flag in the front of the Capitol in South Carolina and thinking, what, would, what must be going through the mind of that man in this moment? I, at some point, uh, maybe two or three months after that, I had the opportunity to visit Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston at the site of the shooting where nine individuals were killed, nine parishioners were killed, including the pastor of that church, Reverend Clementa Pinckney. And I remember thinking, how did we get here? How did we get here? We have come so far with an African-American, a black man in the White House, but yet we have so far to go. That the speeches that were given in, to memorialize this moment, but also to pay tribute to the lives that were lost, but also to bring the country together, has to be the, the hardest speeches he would ever have to make as President of the United States. I remember thinking that. I said my own prayers in front of that church. I prayed for healing, I prayed for some kind of resolution, and in thinking about that moment and in reading the text, 
I think about everything that my first mentor said to me in politics. Words matter. Language matters. Treat every word like gold when you make speeches, when you talk to people, when you talk to the public. And I think that is reflected in this book today. I knew it would have to be, as I said before, Obama's final moment. And I'm glad to see that in the early part of the book, in the prologue even, there's an acknowledgement that the story, and I quote, the story of justice moved forward thanks to women, to farm workers, to laborers, to Americans with disabilities, to Americans with different sexual orientations, to immigrants, to the poor, that there is an acknowledgement that we are all part of this American story at a time when so many are trying to challenge those contributions. And as Martin Luther King has said, as you also wrote, um, we are tired of marching for things that should have been ours at birth, right? And it's an important point that I think we can start this dialogue today. Um, and I want to just read one last passage, which I think should get us off on the right foot. But when Obama gets translated into politics, I'm sorry, when it gets translated into politics, it gets all confused. And trying to bridge the gap between, I think, the good impulses of the overwhelming majority of Americans and how our politics expresses itself continues to be the biggest challenge. This is Obama saying this. And you say, it was quintessential Obama and the emblematic of the rhetorical tightrope. He continued to walk on race. Politicians said provocative things on race all the time, usually clumsily at best. When Obama did, it was usually the most provocative thing of all, the truth. So let's be provocative today, all right? Ladies and gentlemen, Cody Keenan, Ben Rhodes, look forward to hearing from you. Uh, tough to follow, um, but uh, I think we'll, we'll be a little provocative because we'll be a little loose here because Cody and I uh, are the closest of friends and uh, have been collaborators since we met uh, at the bar at Hoolahan's in 2007 in the Obama campaign. Um, so yeah, this we'll, is cheating. We're not at Hoolahan's, but uh, well, I'm going to try to introduce kind of a casual feel to this conversation uh, before we get to your questions. Um, so I'll start here, which is an obvious place to start, which is that you, know, you, as I just referenced, you're on the Obama campaign. We were together eight years um, beginning to end, which is a rare feat of endurance to go all eight years. And yet you chose to write a book about a very focused period of time. Um, uh, why, why make that choice when you had all of the presidency and the campaign to potentially write about, why did you choose this as the subject matter that you wanted to focus on? Well, you'd already written a memoir about all eight years. <laughs> so that, that was gone to me. I'm a little faster writer, man. Yeah, you are. Uh, that was, well, the, uh, the reason mine, the other reason mine took longer is because I, I kept working for him for four years after leaving, and it just didn't feel right to write a book that was largely about him, um, well, then had him on the cover while I was on his immediate payroll. Um, but it was, it was the, you know, it, it, just in case people aren't familiar with the book, it was, it was two things. It was the sheer magnitude of the events that happened over those 10 days. I remember when I, was, when I was sitting down to, when I was starting to tell people that I was writing this book and told them what it was about, they were like, God, man, I remember all those events, of course. I, had, I did not remember they were in a week and a half. And, you and, know. And why don't we just unpack, just in case people haven't read that, you have the health care, the Supreme Court decision upholding Obamacare. So basically Obamacare is going to survive. You have the gay marriage decision codifying gay marriage as law. You have this shooting in Charleston and the speech you have to give. So weirdly, you have some of the most inspiring highlights of the Obama administration coupled with this darkness. It's an incredible week. Yeah, in, in the book, I think, you know, hopefully 10, 20 years from now, it stands up as as one of the two best uh, <laughs> encapsulations of the Obama years. But it's not like we knew these 10 days were coming, right? We knew Supreme Court decisions were coming because they tell you this is when we're gonna give rulings, but you don't know how they're gonna rule or when. So we had to prepare all sorts of different uh, speeches for all sorts of different outcomes. And there were 
There were four possible, there were 14 cases that we were waiting on, two that were really important, obviously, um, on, on Obamacare and marriage equality. And so we had to prepare four speeches for each one because there were four potential outcomes. And there was still a real, Obama was always competent. You know, he didn't look at the, at the defeat scenarios, but, but there was a real chance that the Supreme Court would um, strike down Obamacare, and then, and then you've got tens of millions of people who, not at that time, but now it's 30 million, but, but at that time you've got millions of people who are working two jobs and didn't have health insurance until Obamacare. And then people always forget in the coverage of it too, for the other 100 plus million people who had employer-based care, you would have lost your pre-existing conditions protections too. And that would have ticked a whole lot of people off. But so that's what we're thinking about at all times. Like, and, and we had a whole policy staff that was coming up with all sorts of, in case of emergency, break glass scenarios. What do you do? Marriage equality. There's a very real chance that the Supreme Court just says no, and it wouldn't have it wouldn't have told the entire country you couldn't get married because there were a bunch of states where you could. Um, but it sort of told a vast segment of Americans, basically, your second class citizens who don't get to get married to who you love like the rest of us. So we're writing speeches for all these things, and then this mass shooting happens, which. You can't rank mass shootings, but this is this is up there because there's this additional component to it where it was, you know, black parishioners and a black pastor in a black church, and the killer he he had self radicalized on the internet and was obsessed with Confederate iconography and explicitly said he wanted to start a race war. So you know, White House always kind of goes to high alert after a mass shooting, but this one you start to worry that there could be some pretty nasty stuff bubbling up in the aftermath. Um, and then something extraordinary happens. Two days after the killing, um, they have the arraignment and all the family members show up. And one by one, they face down the killer. And you know, some of them are crying, wailing, screaming. But they all forgave him, like every single one of them, which blew my mind. Um, I'm an Episcopalian, you know, we're not taught that. That is, <laughs> that, is, that is a fundamental tenet of the AME church, though. And I remember learning that from Obama's pastor, a guy named Joshua Dubois. And I asked him, I was like, help me make sense of this. Um, so but there was also a really very real debate going on as to whether or not Obama would give a eulogy at all, and he didn't want to, and I didn't want to write one, because we had already done more than a dozen. Um, but what those families did ultimately tipped him into doing it. And as the, as the week goes on, you start to see, um, as Basil hinted at, you know, even re you have Republican governors kind of quietly bringing down the Confederate flag in the South. Um, Amazon, Walmart, Sears all stopped selling Confederate merchandise. It took South Carolina a little bit longer, because they actually needed a two-thirds majority in the Senate to bring it down. Um, one of the striking things that I, I, I ended a chapter with this because it was so striking, the day after the murder, all of the flags at South Carolina were at half staff except for the Confederate flag because state law said you can't lower it. Um, so it took another month or so, but even that came down too. And then you know, we, we win these decisions and Obama goes and gives this eulogy and sings Amazing Grace and you come back to a White House lit up in all the colors of the rainbow and you know, it's a lot for 10 days. It's, I remember someone writing that it was too implausible for an entire season of the West Wing. <laughs> but to get to your question, the, the, the real reason is what these events mean. And it's whether or not we actually, pract do we actually believe that all of us are created equal? Are we all willing to stand up to white supremacy and inequality and bigotry and violence and this stuff is still alive today. You know, you, you do this killing at the at the nightclub in Colorado last week, where, where people were targeted because of who they are. And um, you have the Tree of Life synagogue shooting a few years ago. And it's just it, whether you're black, LGBTQ, Jewish, like there are still people trying to do this all the time and take us back to, you know, there's a reason I begin the book with the, with a prologue about the Selma speech. I mean, it really is. Are we going to march for? equality, or are we going to be the people on the other side of the bridge who beat people's heads in for it? So we're going to focus on the speech mainly, but I, before we get to that, I want to ask you a question about multitasking. Um, I, I think it's hard to describe the multitasking nature of the presidency in, in the way I will, right, because I was there for the 10 days, um, is I was in the presidential daily briefing, and so we're briefing Obama about, this is the intelligence briefing, and we're briefing him about you know, some national security threats and uh, you know, all kinds of bad things are happening at that time. Uh, and somebody comes in, uh, Ferriel comes in actually, to hand him a note with the Supreme Court decision, which we didn't know what it was. And so we really watched him open the note. And he may have been projecting confidence, but his body released about, you know, uh, uh, 10 tons of tension because he just learned that his signature 
achievement survived. And then we continued the national security briefing. <laughs> Um, the question that that leads to, though, is that you, as a speechwriter, are writing different scenario speeches for positive or negative outcomes on gay marriage, on health care. Then there's a mass shooting. How do you compartmentalize? What were your tools to manage how many issues you had to think about and write about um, you know, at the mercy of events? Yeah, the, the, the first and most important tool was our team. We had, a, we had just a great team of speechwriters. One of my favorite parts of the book is where I just kind of introduce them all. Everybody gets their own paragraph, starting with Ben. Um, and they were all scared of you, too. Like, <laughs> not, not Susanna. Uh, not Susanna. Here, yeah, our assistant's here, right? Yeah. Susanna. Yeah. Um, Susanna has her own paragraph. Um, <laughs> but we, we would have, we'd have our daily speechwriting team meetings. And Ben would almost never come because he had f four other hats, you know. But when he would come in, all the other speechwriters would kind of be like, oh, shit, that's Ben. <laughs> Um, but I had this incredible team, and it, you know, we had we still had all the daily speeches of the presidency that week too. He did like he did a Medal of Honor ceremony, he did a Pride reception, he did an Iftar dinner, I think an economic speech. So they're all working on those. I asked a, a woman on our staff named Sarah Perry to draft the marriage equality remarks. Um, I was selfish, and I always kept the Obamacare remarks for myself because I had done most of them leading up to it, and I still kind of carried this penance for all the hiccups along the way. Um, and then I knew Charleston was the type of thing that I would just have to do. But So I would lean on the team, I would lean on you constantly, I would lean on my wife constantly who worked at the White House. Um, but there was, someone asked me at an event, how did, how did you take care of yourself? Like what was your self care? I was drinking, if yeah, I remember. I, uh, yeah. What are you talking my, about? I mean, you know, we, there is no we were doing it together so I can vouch for it. There is know, no yeah. time for self care in the White House. It's just, <laughs> you just, you just, you move and react and, and do the job. It's kind of like, I've been traveling all over the country the past couple months, so I've seen Top Gun 2 on airplanes like 10 times. And uh, what they say in there, they're like, don't think, just do. You know, and that's sort of what it was. Well, but I'm going to plug your book here for a second, because one of the things that you, comes out in spades in the book, you mentioned the team, and you're very generous, rightly, about the team, but like the self-care were, were the people, right? I mean, the, other, the people that you worked with just how much you could rely on them as, as, as people in the foxhole. And that gets back to what you were saying about the fact that we, you and I stayed all eight years, but more people stayed all eight years in the Obama White House than any other White House. And I think all that is rooted in the campaign, because it was also the longest primary campaign in history. And we became a family. We were together 14 hours a day. And then when that was done, we'd go out together, and then we'd sleep four hours and do it over again. And we became a family, quite literally. I, I lived with two of our other colleagues, Tommy Vitor and Michael O'Neill, and then my future wife moved in with us, and we got married, and, and you know, I joked with Obama a couple weeks ago, he finally met my daughter after two years of COVID, and like, I've always wanted that. Everybody's seen the shot of Ben's daughter, you know, with, with Obama. In case you don't know, she's wearing the elephant costume and yeah. he's holding her up. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody yeah. wants that shot of their kids with Obama, and I finally got it for two years, cause, just because of COVID, but uh, I joked with him that he's got dozens of grandbabies running around the country now from, from <laughs> people who met working for him, whether it was in Iowa or any of the other state contests or the administration or afterwards. Um, and we just, we carried each other through. We went to each other's weddings. Ben was in my wedding. We went to each other's parents' funerals. We were just, we were a pretty tight-knit family. Yeah, and, and actually, I swear we're going to get to the speech, but you also detail the book is a love story um, with a twist, which is Cody may be one of the few people who actually married his own fact checker. Uh, why don't you describe, <laughs> describe that uh, for the audience here? I mean, it was, we met on her first day uh, in the White House and I was just, I was toast. Um, but I had to play it cool for a long time because you know, it's, it's a workplace. And she, but her job was to fact check everything I wrote and it wouldn't just be, it wasn't light stuff. It was like multiple page documents with several sources telling me why I was wrong every single day. And in, in one of my more tired jokes, now she does that for free. Um, but It's a good joke, though. Thank you. She keep using it. Yeah. Um, she couldn't make it tonight because she's with our daughter. Um, but uh, it, it just, it, she was somebody who got me through, too. Um, not just because she kept, you know, my rhetoric on the straight and narrow, but she kept me on the straight and narrow. And if, if I, whenever I, I was freaking out about a speech, I went to Ben or my wife or Terry Zuplat, who sat in the office next door, and we were kind of each other's support system. So getting into this speech, um, I, I, there was something that, you know, you revisit in the book, 
and you mentioned it already, but like the only two people I think in the entire Obama White House who thought there was any scenario in which he wasn't going to go down to Charleston and deliver this eulogy were you and Barack Obama. Um, obviously, he was going to speak, um, and there was kind of a weird debate for a day or two about would he go and just attend the memorial and not speak. Um, I, I want to press you on this. Like, did you did you really think there was any scenario in which he wouldn't have to give a speech, and why were you guys reticent to to do that? Yeah, it turns out there is something false about hope. Uh, <laughs> we, we just, I I selfishly didn't want to write one because this was not only had we done this so many times, but writing about race is just an added terror a lot of the time. Um, not because my words would go out to society unfiltered. He he was there, right? But I, I wanted to get him something that he'd be happy with, that, that would always impress him. But so going, this goes further back to after Newtown, and, and believe it or not, we're coming up with the 10th anniversary of Newtown in a couple weeks, and this was when um, 20 little kids were murdered in their classroom in Connecticut along with uh, six of the teachers who died trying to protect them. And uh, Obama had just been reelected, and... Um, Favs, John Favreau was working on the second inaugural, and um, so he asked me to take uh, that eulogy, and that eulogy was just 48 hours after um, the massacre, which is pretty tight, and, and you know the elementary school is still a crime scene, so we had to do it at the high school, and Obama spent three hours um, visiting with all of the families, and, and like their, you know, the, the siblings of these kids were all dressed up in dresses and suits and kind of chafing at it and didn't, they weren't old enough to understand where their siblings had gone and it was just, the whole thing was heartbreaking. And it was the only time he's, he said this, that, that he saw a Secret Service agent cry. And, um, so he gives this eulogy and then decides to kind of push the second term agenda aside and start out by doing something about guns because how could you not? And the one, we knew how long the odds were. We knew, you know, we didn't have votes to overcome a filibuster, but we got an unexpected shot of hope because two conservative senators with A ratings from the NRA, Joe Manchin, Democrat, and Pat Toomey, a Republican, decided to write a, a universal background check bill. And it had 90% support from Democrats, 80% from uh, Republicans, 70% from NRA households. Most Americans thought it was the law. So we said, let's do it, let's try. And we barnstormed the country, did a bunch of speeches for a couple months, and then um, Republicans filibustered it anyway in the Senate, didn't even allow a vote with the parents looking on from the gallery. And that's about as cynical as I've ever seen Barack Obama. He, he went out and gave a pretty angry statement in the Rose Garden and came back inside and said, you know, what do I do the next time this happens? I don't want to speak the next time this happens. There's this cycle where, you know, we point fingers, the NRA shrinks away, I have to go out and give a eulogy, and then we all just kind of collectively move on, and I don't want to give that signal that it's okay to move on after the next one. And so he had to do two more after mass shootings on military bases because he's the commander in chief, um, Fort Hood, the second one at Fort Hood of his presidency and the Navy Yard. And then Charleston was kind of the first test of that. And you're right, we might have been the only two. But we, when we did have, <clears throat> on, on the sixth day of the 10 days, it was that Monday, uh, we did have a pretty passionate debate in the Oval Office about whether or not to do it. And Valerie Jarrett was pushing pretty hard for it. Um, Obama uh, was, was, was anti. And for the, you know, for the first time, he used me as a human shield instead of a punching bag, he looked at me and said, he said, we have run out of words. Do you have anything left to say? And I said, no. Um, and then it was Josh Ernest who reminded the president of what those, those families did. And then you, you saw, once you saw Obama's shoulders drop, you knew it was over. Well, I, I, so I'm going to ask now two questions. The second one is going to be a harder one um, that bring me into this as someone who's also a speechwriter for that the whole time. Um, about what it's like to write for Barack Obama. Um, so starting with like what, what will be the easier one, I remember that uh, there was a shooting in Dallas, some of you may remember in 2016, in which uh, several police officers were killed. And it was tied up with Black Lives Matter and the discourse. And once again, he was gonna have to go down to this memorial and speak. And I was on a foreign trip with him at the time. We were at a NATO summit in Poland, again, multitasking. And he didn't wanna speak. And I said to him, look, you should be honored that people are really interested in what you have to say. Because <laughs> like, there are presidents, and he was succeeded by one, who nobody would care what they have to say after something like that. You know? And actually, I don't think Trump spoke after any mass shootings, right? It, uh, and uh, I won't name any others, but there are other presidents that, it, but, so there was this kind of charge where like something would happen and like, 
people expected Barack Obama to speak because they thought he had something important to say about it, not just because he was president, but because he was Barack Obama. And the question is, like, what, as someone who inhabited that myself, like, what did that feel like to you that you knew on some level that you weren't just writing for the president, you're writing for this guy that, because of his reputation as an order, because of his identity, because of a lot of things, like, people really were interested in what he had to say about things. Yeah, and then to, to add on to your Trump point, even during the Trump administration, people wouldn't ask, you know, what is Trump gonna say? They would ask, can Obama say something? Yeah. They would still ask the last guy to come out and make sense of it all. Um, I mean, it was hard because he was, and I'm not just being self-deprecating here, he was, uh, he's smarter than I am, <laughs> and he's on record as saying he's a better speechwriter than a speechwriter, so that's always a little daunting. Um, <laughs> But the, you know, the first thing I would always try to do, you, you two really had, to use a cliche, like a mind meld on foreign policy. Like, you two shared a worldview on that. I adopted a lot of my worldview from Barack Obama. So did I. I mean, it's easy to get to a mind meld when you just adopt the other guy's uh, yeah. thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, but so the, the first thing I would try to do is a lot of listening um, and try to get as much out of him as I could before I'd go right. The, what made the Charleston one so hard is when he said we'd run out of words. That's never really true, because you, you can find inspiration anywhere. But his instructions to me in the Oval Office were, all right, he said, uh, all right, if I go speak, um, I want to talk about guns, I want to talk about race, I want to talk about the Confederate flag and the pain it stirs in so many of our citizens, and I want to wrap it up in the concept of grace. And I just, I just kind of stared at him, and he said, all right, so uh, go get to work, pour a drink and let it rip. And I was just like, what the fuck? What do, what do I do about this? So this is the question I really wanted to ask, like, because we didn't talk about this enough um, for all those years, like, you know, 10 years, two years in the campaign, eight years in the, in the White House. And then, you know, I, I was on the payroll a little bit, not, uh, not as a speechwriter after, but um, I want to ask you what it's like to be a white guy writing for a, a black guy. Um, because it, it was a weird thing, right? And we didn't talk, we should have talked about it more, actually. I, I kind of regret that we didn't all talk about it more. Um, I remember feeling it really acutely um, and probably had a very similar speech writing experience that you did um, when Nelson Mandela died. And I realized I was gonna have to write the eulogy that Barack Obama would give for Nelson Mandela in South Africa that billions of people would watch, you know, and, and I realized immediately I was completely inadequate. You know, I've never felt more terrified. Yeah, and who, are, who are we? Yeah, like I felt like an imposter. I felt, you know, I, I, I can give you something, I, you know, but what I'll give you is the kind of the white guy version, the, the white liberal version, which is probably totally, um, you know, uh, going to miss a lot. Um, I, I mean, before we even get into to the speech itself, I mean, just how did you think about being a white person writing for the first black president? Yeah, like I write in the, in the book, I've never felt whiter than when I was writing for the first black president. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I always, I always started by listening because you are, these are not our words on a page, they are his words on a page. And our job was to, I always viewed our job as basically to write what he would if he had the time. That's not how he viewed the relationship. He, yeah. He viewed it as a collaboration. He would tell us over and over again, we are collaborators. Just give me something I can work with. And that was never really enough for me. I would still stay up all night long trying to get him some. I wanted to impress him, because he was a good boss. And I, I wanted to, the other side of having imposter syndrome is wanting to desperately prove that you belong there. And even though, you know, to get back to race, even though Obama and I come from the same hometown, only a few miles apart, the, those miles apart are worlds away. You know, I was born in Wrigleyville, right? His, his, he made his hometown on the south side. Those are two completely different parts of Chicago and America. And so there, you know, to be a speechwriter is to have a deep sense of empathy. You're supposed to be able to understand any audience, get in their shoes. You know, I've written for, I've written for Michelle Obama, right? Um, and, and her two speechwriters are white too. But you're still aware of this at all times. And I did ask him about it once. I said, because first of all, he chose John Favreau. He chose me. He invested a lot of time in us and in making sure that we understood his worldview and understood how he wrote and, and all that. And I still asked him, you know, do you ever wish you had a black chief speechwriter? Um, and his answer surprised me because it was a little fatalistic. He said the system doesn't allow for it. And what he meant by that is, you know, I 
was able to start out in politics because I could take a, an unpaid internship for three months out of college because my parents could afford to cover my rent. And that immediately eliminates a lot of people from the political system. And that's starting to change. You know, There are internships on in Congress now that pay more than my first salary did working for Ted Kennedy. But it takes a long time. And you know, I have a speech writing company now. And we, we work, we've worked really, really hard to, um, we're now half writers of color and half women. But there's still a long way to go. And, this is true of any sector in society. Yeah, there's not a pipeline uh, that there should. There's like just there not a pipeline. But but to get back to your question, it's I'm not writing for myself. I'm, I'm these are his words. But the hard part was trying to inhabit something that you will never understand. I will never understand what it's like to be a black man in America. You know, no matter how many times I've read his books or listened to him talk about it, you, it almost just feels like guesswork. And then we would rely on him to to take it to a higher place. So we're going to get a bit in the weeds of speech writing here, but it's speech writing for Barack Obama, so I think it's interesting. Um, weirdly, to me, the best thing that could happen when you gave him a draft, because like sometimes you give him a draft and he'd come back with just some line edits right on the draft and you input the line edits and maybe there's another draft. But the best thing that could happen is actually you give him a draft and then it comes back not just with line edits but with yellow legal pad, written out paragraphs, because on the one end, it's kind of you know, humiliating, like he had to rewrite parts of the speech. But on the other end, you knew it was going to be much better because it was going to be much more personal. How did you think about the parts of that speech that were going to be inevitably the yellow legal pad yeah. versus, like, like, I'm one of the only people who can, you know, under, you know what I mean? Like, what is the Cody Keenan part that was going to be on the white line edit part? And what was going to be the Barack Obama yellow legal pad part of that speech? I love that feeling too, because it's the the uncertainty before you give him that draft is the killer. You never know, you don't know if he's going to like this or not. It's rare when you're like, "This is great, this is he's going to love this." But once you give it to him, if he gives you it back with the yellow legal pattern, at least you know, right? You have some, you have some different direction to go in now. But so, for a eulogy, there's there's a basic structure to it. You know, you, you speak to the first rows first, the people who've lost the most, then the, then the community, and then there's all these camera lenses in the back where you speak to the wider world if you're a president. And the first part of it is you really pay tribute to um, you know, the victim. In this case, it was, it, was, it was just a memorial service for Reverend Pinckney, you know, one of the nine memorial services over that week down there, but he's speaking for all of them. And so the first part is and you Reverend are. And Reverend Pinkney is a towering figure in his own right. Incredible. Yeah. It, he was. He was. I, I remember the, there were two lines that stood out doing my research. And one of them, one of his, somebody once said of him when he walked into a room, it was like the future arrived. And what an extraordinary thing to say about somebody. He was not just a reverend. He was a state representative representing one of the poorest parts of the state. So he was just. He was working six days a week, for. Um, his constituents, and then he was he was preaching to his congregation, and he just all these people were his flock that he was working for twenty four seven, and to take that away was was just extra cruel. Um, I likened it to, to when Bo Biden died. You know, it was it was this person was the future, and no one's ever said a bad thing about this person, and now it's been taken away from us. Um, it's different, of course, but there's there's this sense of loss there. So, the first part of it is you're you're paying tribute to this person's life, and I've never viewed. I don't think eulogies have to be sad because Reverend Pinkney's life was not sad. The way he was taken from us was. But if you can make people laugh in a eulogy, I think that's a special gift. If you can make people smile, it's a special gift. So I, I knew the first two pages would survive. And Susanna you know, would find all sorts of amazing research about victims, which, what an awful task. You know, Susanna literally had a template of what to look for um, after mass shootings. Um, but then, you, then you, you take a lesson from this person's life and make it bigger. And that's the part. You know, the part where he said, talk about race and guns and the Confederate flag and rapid grace, where I knew I was just kind of flailing. And one of, the, one of the embarrassing things in the book is I actually went back to my drafts and I included some of the language that he cut. Um, and it's embarrassing to share that, but I wanted to show what it's actually like. So I, I, I finally gave him the speech around 5.30 the, the day before. And I told him, I was like, look, the first half is solid. Second half is going to need a little work, and he was cool about it. He was like, "Great, I will. I'll work on it tonight, and I'll give it back to you in the morning." Um, he called me back to the White House at 11 p.m. and he had it was a four-page speech, and he had just drawn one big line through pages three and four, which he had never done to me before, and uh, just he'd done that to me, and just re <laughs> and rewrote him longhand. And the annoying thing about it is, it was what he did was so simple. He took 
he took, he added, he took, he basically stopped where I had had the phrase Amazing Grace, and he added the lyrics, and then he built the structure of the speech out of the lyrics, um, which, I, which was so beautifully simple that I was furious at myself for not thinking of it. Well, but that's when you realize he's, you know, he's actually a writer, like you're writing for a writer, which is kind of, kind of daunting uh, in its own way. I mean, the one thing I want to, um, two more questions, and the second one's going to be about Amazing Grace, because that's what everybody remembers, but I remember reading the draft when you sent it around, like you incorporated those edits and your extraordinary work and sent it around. And this is before anybody knew he was gonna sing Amazing Grace. It was like the edgiest speech he ever gave as president. On, like I think sometimes, obviously what people focuses on, f focus on now is the singing of Amazing Grace. But when you go back and read that section on the flag and guns and like it is, it's out there. Like, did you think? I mean, when you were you aware of that? <laughs> like, I, I remember reading yeah. this, being like, "He's going to say this," you know? Yes, and it gets back to what Basil was saying. It was edgy because it was the truth. Yeah. There's nothing he said that we don't all instinctively know. You just we don't say these things out loud to each other. You know, one of the one of the things he added that it, that just shows why he's so good, and how he I don't know how he remembers the things he does, but he remembered this University of Chicago study where uh, somebody sent out 100 identical resumes. Half of them, the person's name was Johnny, half of them, the person's name was Jamal, and the callback rate for Jamal was so much lower. And he just added into the speech in a more beautiful way. It was like, you know, maybe we have to examine our own biases, bias, biases when um, you know, we call Johnny back for an interview but not Jamal. And you saw it was mostly black audience and everyone was nodding, and it was just that thing. That's not something I would have remembered to pull out or written that way. And it's only edgy because it's true. But I think what you capture in the book, which everybody should buy if you haven't bought it already, and it makes a good gift too, um, <laughs> is... Um, Spread some graces. Is season. it like, even if you don't write the thing that he says, sometimes the thing you write like triggers the thing that gives him yeah. the idea, yeah. you know? So you should you know, give yourself more credit for that. Now, the singing, which I'm sure everybody... I remember I was... God knows what I was working on that day. But you, like... We, weirdly, we didn't text, we like emailed. Um, you emailed me as you were getting on uh, the to the helicopter, I think, to, to go to Air Force One. Hey, he said this thing that he might sing Amazing Grace at the end of the speech. Um, and I was like, well, that, that would be interesting, you know? Um, I mean, w just walk us through that, both like that conversation to the point where you're watching him give this speech and there's that moment where he comes to where he stops, you know, and he's, watch the video tonight when you go home, you'll feel better about life um, and this country, where he stops and you, you know, he's thinking like, I'm gonna do it, you know? Um, and then he, like, what, just take us through that. Well, what's great is every time I do a TV interview on this book tour, they, they lead me in by showing it. him yeah, singing yeah, yeah. Amazing Grace, so I get it all the time. They, people can do that for the rest of my life if they want to. Um, going back to what you said about, about what we worked on trigger something he in in his brain he was good enough a boss to point that out even when he tore up half my speech and rewrote it like i did feel bad about that i did apologize to him for the first time but this is what made him such a good boss he he could have um given my edits to you and excised me from the equation completely he could have told me you know he could have like passive aggressively like so many bosses said you know do better or uh well yeah you know just just take this and work on it he walked me through it and he said, after I apologized, he said, look, brother, we're collaborators. You gave me what I needed to work with here. You'll see some of your work and what I rewrote. And when you've been thinking about Ray's for 40 years, you'll know what you want to say, too. So that's the type of thing. That's why he's a good boss, because you walk away from that not feeling like you've failed. You feel better about yourself. Um, but in that rewrite, he had added the lyrics. And in the morning on the helicopter, and this was you know, five minutes after he gave remarks on marriage equality, um, by which you could tell he was visibly moved. Um, he says, you know, if it feels right, I might sing it. And I was like, that's cool. And I forgot to tell, I should have told everybody else at the White House, I basically, I just emailed you, Anita, Terry, and my wife. And you, you replied, you were like, oh, it's a great idea, people will love it. And I forgot to tell anyone else. So it was a surprise for everybody else, including the staff <laughs> on the trip who came running out of the makeshift offices under the arena being like, is he singing? I had just forgotten. <laughs> I stayed on the plane, I didn't actually, I was in Charleston, but I stayed on Air Force One because he was still working on the eulogy and the motorcade. Um, he took the last two pages with him 
And you know, we had these, it was 2015, but we had these janky wireless cards for our laptops with all these security protocols. And there was, I just wasn't gonna take the risk that we got to the arena and there were thousands of people. And you know, cell signals are worse when there are thousands of people. I wasn't gonna take the risk of not getting the eulogy where it needed to be, so I stayed on the plane. Um, so I was watching it on TV and, and Tanya, one of our favorite stewards came around, saw that I was sitting alone and she was like, you want a beer? And I said, yeah. So I got to watch on, on CNN. She was great, actually. She was great. Yeah, now that you mentioned it. I got yeah, to watch on yeah. CNN. I was drinking a beer. And so I, I see him pause, but I know he's going to do it. When you see, yeah, yeah. When you see the paused, service on I, TV, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. this is, it's an extraordinary event because it, it, it is not, it's, this, is a, this is a black church service with a black president adopting the cadence of a preacher and tying together American exceptionalism and progressive um, politics and faith for a national audience. You know, it became this quintessentially American thing that just you don't see very often. So, and but you, you can hear you know the organs piping in, and so you're like, of course he's going to sing. Well, which again, uh, one last question, then we'll, I want to. But the, the well, so I, I want to answer your question. Yeah. He he did pause for eleven seconds, and yeah. I asked him afterwards. My first thought watching it was, people at home are gonna are gonna think he's he miss, he's missing a page. <laughs> you know, like he's pulling that Janine Pirro thing where he doesn't have the next page. Um, so I asked him about it, and he said, we, we said, well, look, brother, you, you know what the thing about Amazing Grace is. I'm like, no, I have no idea. What is it? And he said, well, you got to start low, because otherwise, by the time you get to a wretch like me, your voice cracks. So I was just like preparing myself to get low. It's, I mean, it's why I don't sing. Um, so the, so the last question I want to ask, like, I've always thought about this. I've always felt kind of conflicted about this. Um, and the black church is central to this question in a way, because in the black church is so central to Obama, like he'd never be president without the black church, which is kind of interesting because what people associate him with in the black church is Jeremiah Wright. But basically, that's where, like him as an order, he wouldn't have been president without his rhetorical skill. It's all cultivated through the black church, you know. And if you, do, if you see him, another speech of people on Google tonight, he gave a speech in the campaign about the Joshua generation um, that, you know, really situates him in the tradition of the black church. And all those speeches we were on the campaign that, you know, like they were echoing that tradition. But the question I wanted to ask, what was kind of conflicting to me, I consider that moment, you know, the most, uh, among the most powerful, if not the most powerful moment in the Obama presidency. And as you say, it's kind of this joyful moment. And even in the, in the room, like the, the organs playing, the guys are on their feet behind him, and there's all this rel release, cathartic release, um, but those people died, you know? Um, it's sad, and they're not coming back. Like, the speech didn't bring them back. And there's something about the black church, though, that redeems loss and allows you to feel okay about feeling good about singing Amazing Grace, even in the worst circumstance. But I do just wonder, how do you unpack that loss of those people? Because there was a really powerful moment, I was in the Oval Office a few days after that, where he read aloud, he had a letter, he would read these letters, and he read aloud a letter he got from this guy. It was a very short letter. And the letter said, Mr. President, I've always been a racist. I hated black people. I thought black people were less than, than me. And I saw you give that speech and I realized I was wrong. And we all were like, and I think I said something, you know me, I can't sh keep my mouth shut. Um, and I was like, well, that's like the purpose of the whole presidency right there. And he goes, yeah, it's a shame that those people had to die for that guy to write this letter. Um, and that, so I just wanna ask you to reflect on like how weird it is that this kind of apex moment of the Obama presidency was also this just tragic moment. Do you think about those people? That that le I, I printed a bunch of these letters in the book after this after the section on the speech and I mean that that proves it's the lyrics of the song and it's what he wrote the back half of the speech about I once was blind but now I see speeches can change minds you know maybe not on a massive scale but they can Obama was was the one who kept us mindful that day because there really was there was a scene at the at the White House that morning of jubilation after marriage equality you know because so many of our colleagues were gay. Um, and it's hard not to watch the scenes on television and be joyful. Obama was still mindful that he had to go eulogize these people. And, and not just that they were taken from us, but it was really an act of terrorism. 
I mean, this person went into the place where black people in that community are supposed to feel safe. I mean, targets on, the, on, a, on black churches are nothing new, but they are every single time designed to instill fear um, and hatred. And so I can't reconcile that. And like I said earlier, it's still happening right now, whether it's a, a, a trans nightclub or a synagogue. Or I mean, Buffalo. Or Buffalo. I mean, these are, these are chosen on purpose. There, it was like a, a two-week stretch in 2018 where you know, it was the Tree of Life Synagogue, it was a yoga studio, and it was a misogynist who went into a women's yoga studio. It's, and this gets back to words mattering. You know, people will still ask me, do speeches matter? And if you don't believe that they do, all you have to do is look at the, the Trump presidency because he unleashed some really awful stuff. You know, he, he turned over the rocks that people have been hiding under. People marched in Charlottesville with their hoods off, and that's all because their president gave them a permission structure to do this. So I can't reconcile all that. I mean, this, this gets back to the, the thesis of the book. I stole, and Obama knows this, I stole from something he added to the Selma speech, which is that politics is not a clash of armies, but a clash of wills. It's a contest to determine the true meaning of America. And all of us have to be engaged in that contest. We don't get to sit it out. You know, and, and who, whichever side works hardest, longest, is the side that will determine what America means uh, and what we care about. Any questions? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we, we got one in the we got one in the back there. Uh, Cody, assuming where you're born, um, I'm ass I know where your baseball allegiances lie. But uh, as a lifelong White Sox fan, I cannot tell you how much it meant to all the South Side that we had the most powerful man in the world being a White Sox fan. <laughs> um, and I apologize for that. Did, didn't help the White Sox that much, though. Huh? And no, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a Mets fan, so True, you know, yeah. trust me, well, I, we have I'm with you guys. Now, that, that really hurt. And also, I used to respect Mets fans until you said that. But um, basically, uh, it's kind of tawdry, but like when you first started dating your now wife, did you guys keep it a secret? Were there any good anecdotes until everyone knew, uh, protocol, that kind of thing? Oh yeah, this is a good question, yeah. Uh, yeah. You're gonna love chapter four. Um, <laughs> but I will say, I, you know, we, we, I, I, I always joked when people asked, are you gonna stay in the White House? All, like, when are you gonna leave the White House? And I would say, I'm not leaving until the Cubs win the World Series. And then they did in our eighth year. Um, yeah, I, I was very nervous because you don't, you, well, it, most of all, I didn't want to make my future wife feel uncomfortable by, you have to ask somebody out, right? How do you do that when you work together and her office is literally next door to yours and you're on the same team um, in a workplace? You know, it's not, my parents met on their first day of work here in New York City, but this isn't 1974 anymore, you know? So I wanted to be, I was really careful about it. First time I asked her out, she said, no, done deal, fine. You, and then you go to work the next day and you are a model colleague. You, you, you just make sure you are just as good a colleague as you were the day before. Um, two months later, we were both at a party together on a Friday night, so I just was inspired to ask her again. She said, no, okay, fine. That's, <laughs> I'm gonna drop it, I'm gonna leave it alone. Um, then two months after that, we were at a White House Christmas party and she had one of her friends with her from college and she told, her friend told me, she said, you should ask Kristen out again. So I asked her out again and she said no. And, <laughs> Now I'm starting to worry that this was a trap and I'm gonna get fired, like HR is gonna call the next morning. And, but then Kristen emailed the next morning, she said, I changed my mind, I'll go out with you. Um, and um, so, yeah, good for her. And now, <laughs> and now, we, now we live in New York City and we have a, a two-year-old daughter named Grace, so it all worked out. But you didn't, uh, uh, even more important than the book there. Uh, we did Grace. keep it private, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, you guys did keep it private, I knew. Um, but uh, but you, it was a it was a state secret for for a while there. Um, it's also because she was she was newer to the White House. She joined in 2011, and you don't want people to think yeah. that you're dating somebody else yeah. at the White House to improve your situation. Like it's still you know we we have not gotten rid of the idea that um, you know a woman needs a man to get ahead. And I'm not saying this as, as cleverly as I should, but like she was very nervous about that. And she I just said I don't want anyone to think that you and I are together because it might help my career. You know, and I, I was like, that's not why. And she said, but it doesn't, doesn't matter. That's what other people are going to think. You know, and she was right. So we kept it quiet as, as long as we possibly could. And yep. Let's see, it's coming here. 
Hi. Um, so something that I appreciate about both your books is that it's made this world of politics and policy seem so accessible and kind of gave a window into this field that isn't often humanized. And I'm curious if there's something that you learned during your time with Obama that you wish you had known earlier that you could maybe go back and tell your 20-something self, what would it be? Great question. Great question. I'm so glad you, I'll filibuster, I'm so glad uh, you said that because I teach speech writing now. I teach seniors at Northwestern University, which is where I went to school. And one of the things I want them and everyone in their generation to take away from this book is that you know, we're fed this steady diet of cynicism every day, that, that everybody's in it for themselves, that you know, nobody in politics cares, and like, I can tell you it's not true. Um, it's frustrating, you never get everything that you want, but you can do a lot of good and have a lot of fun and surround yourself with people who believe in a better world. Um, so I, I, I just, I push my students so hard to go into politics, um, because it's worth it. It is a worthy vessel into which they should pour their time and energy. Um, what did I learn? Maybe that, you know, because I don't, I didn't know that when I graduated from college. You, you know, you, uh, people always make fun of, of, of the TV show The West Wing for not being real. Well, of course it's not real, it's a TV show, you know, I, I, I but it was the, it was one of the number one shows on television when I graduated from college in 2002. And so you think politics is fun and interesting and I will give that show credit for putting a whole generation of people into it. That doesn't mean we thought it was gonna be that way. Like I don't walk into a bar and say, well this doesn't look like Cheers at all, <laughs> you know? But, but it was something that was inspiring and inspired us to go in and over time, you know, my first job was, was just opening mail in Ted Kennedy's mailroom and seeing what perfect strangers from all over the country wrote to the last Kennedy brother. And that changed me right away um, in terms of seeing how important politics is and it was something I kept with me forever. Uh, I'll I'll answer uh, too, just, and I had the benefit of sitting here and thinking about this, but I, what I'd say is what I would tell myself is actually that your superpower is that you're young. So when I came in the White House and we all came in, there was a lot of grumbling about us, the young campaign staff. That was what was always attached to us, like a moniker. Probably more even to me because I was in national security. And so you, what do you do? You, you try to be old. <laughs> you know, you, um, but actually being young, I think the reason Obama had us there is he wanted young people. Because young people think about things different. I, th I thought about things differently when I was 29 on the campaign than I do now. And, and sure, I have some hard earned wisdom, but I had some idealism and, and, and energy that was really important. The, the best, work we did, arguably, was in 2008 on that campaign. It was the only time in my life that I have any idea what it must feel like to be in a successful like pop group. Because every speech we wrote was like a hit. It didn't matter what <laughs> lyrics were, you know, yes we can, and the, the, you know, the New Hampshire speech, the South Carolina speech, and you remember that, and it was, it was crazy. We were writing those speeches in three hours. But we were closer to the culture because we were young. We, you know, we knew what was on people's minds, what, cult what they were consuming. Obama could have a bad debate and go out the next day and go like this. And everybody knew he's referencing Jay-Z, except Hillary Clinton and, you know, uh, and, and no offense Hillary Clinton, but I mean, the point is that like, young people are often told in politics that they don't know what they're talking about, that they're not experienced enough, that's bullshit. Young people are the people who've made progress in this country. Whether it's the civil rights movement, whether it's the 2008 Obama campaign, where you look at the suffragettes, how old they were when they started, we look at abolitionists, how old they, they were when they John started. John Lewis. If we kept young, yeah, John Lewis, if we kept young people out of politics, things would not get better. And so the thing I would tell myself is actually don't be embarrassed about your age, because your age is, is, is essential to this project. We weren't cynical. And he, and he wanted that around him because a lot of what you do in the White House is actually convincing America not to be cynical, like every day in every speech. Yeah, and whereas the Trump presidency is a whole project designed to convince you to be cynical. Um, all right, any more questions? Uh, okay, yeah, here. Um, actually, um, I am an immigrant. I was born and raised in Venezuela, but I've been more or less 15 years in the U.S. 
Um, and I've, you know, as somebody who's an outsider but an insider, I always felt, and I know this has been discussed, that the U.S. is the experiment of a multi-rational uh, racial democracy, right? And there's been a lot of discussions about this. And, um, you know, I, I, I think about, you know, in your book, in this 10 days, and I think about old struggles and things that were defined, as you were saying, about the American values and what democracy means in the United States and the really big um, challenges that we have that's not, you know, not to be naive. But then I think about, like, how we're going to overcome this or how, how can we continue to be this great example of, this democracy that it really doesn't happen in, in a lot of places. And I want to believe that it's it's still the big example that we have in the world. Um, and then again, I think about like how can we continue to believe that? And then I look back. And then again, a book like this would think about this 10 days that all these things happened that were really difficult. It sort of gives me hope that if we look into the past and the things that we have overcome as a you know an American society and, and the democracy itself, it can continue to be like that. I, and I, I wonder if, like, again, in the spirit of this not being cynical, if, if that's how you look into what's next for our American democracy. Thank you. Yeah, and I think you just touched on a key point. You actually have to widen the aperture a bit, which is not satisfying in the moment when so much awful stuff is going on. But <clears throat> what I haven't said yet tonight is all of the major triumphs of that week in the book were not because of Barack Obama. You know, I mean, he pushed for Obamacare, sure. But that was also the result of a 100-year movement for universal health care that you know, he brought us closer to than ever. And even though we're still not there, you, know, you protect what you've got and you push for the rest. Marriage equality was a result of a 50-year-plus movement for LGBTQ rights that people died for. We are 400 years into a civil rights and equality struggle. Um, these, these brilliant um, groups, Moms Demand in every town, that are, that are changing gun laws across the country slowly but surely kind of came out of the Obama years and all the horrible mass shootings. And so if you, if you widen the aperture for the, to look at the entire trajectory of America, like it's undeniable that we are becoming a true democracy, that we are proving this works, but if you look at it day to day, it's really difficult to see it that way. Um, and that's not a satisfying answer, but it's, it's the true one. Okay, we'll take uh, one more question there in the back. I'm not sure what my question is, but um, going back to the concept of words and how important they are and how important uh, they were with Barack Obama. And now we have words that have sent us off in, in a different direction. And I'm just sort of curious, and maybe it's your professor hat that you put on. How do you talk to the students about the power of words and how they have played out in the last five years, the last presidency versus the Obama presidency? Yeah, uh, very simple. Um, speech writing is thinking before you speak. Tweeting is speaking before you think. Uh, you know? I've done both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, ben teaches too. I mean, I, the kids give me, this gets back to the last question too, my kids, I call them my kids. Um, I teach in the exact same room I took a lot of poli-sci classes on, you know, and they give me a lot of hope because even though they are fed this steady diet of cynicism all the time too, um, think of the ways we grew up. I was born in 1980, right? And you can look back on the 80s and 90s as kind of this relative time of peace and prosperity where America strode, you know, the colossus of the world and everything was fine. It was just like the battle of the boy bands was the biggest problem. Um, that's obviously not true for everybody. You know, the history, our past is never good for everybody. But my students were born after 9-11. And they came of age during two wars and a catastrophic recession and a pandemic and torture and climate change. Is, they see it in a way that I didn't have to when I was in college in 1998. Um, they're not sure that their future will exist. They've gone through active shooter drills in school. So change to them is existential, and they are very impatient to get in and make things different. Um, and the fact that they are willing to do it gives me a lot of hope. That's a great note to end on. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Cody, for writing a great book. Um, I, wanna, I don't want to send people in the wrong direction or crash the New Deal, or, uh, but uh, yeah. <laughs> No, listen, thank you. Thanks again for being here. What a wonderful conversation. Let's give them another round of applause.
three very quick things uh, before we end. First, you mentioned Jeremiah Wright, and I have to say, if you haven't heard the speech, the speech on race he gave in Philadelphia, one of the best speeches I've ever heard, I teach that speech because it is a great example of how to reframe the conversation. When you see things going in one direction, here's how you reset the conversation. It's a fantastic speech. I don't know if you wrote that speech. No, that was another one he tore up half of. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, is a, it is a fascinating sort of look into where, where the conversation in America was going in that moment, particularly where he was uh, focused on him and how he turned the conversation around. Um, the second point is that so because there's so many of you who are new to this building, I just want to say that we do teach in this building too. So we have a number of students come in for a variety of classes. I have one in education policy that's meeting in 15 minutes. Um, and so uh, feel free to tell your family and friends about the work that we do here in, in Roosevelt House. We have a ton of other programs and book talks just like this. And in fact, I think December 14th, we also are partnering with Cornell's Institute of Politics, my alma mater, um, to um, have a discussion about polling in America. So we have a chief Democratic pollster and a chief Republican pollster um, coming in to talk about what's right, what they did right, what they did wrong, and what they're seeing in America right now. Um, and finally, yes, we have a great reception for you uh, in the Four Freedoms Room, which is on the first floor. There are going to be books available for you and a book signing by the author. Um, so thank you for coming. We love to see you. We love to see more of you. Welcome and thank you. Thank you.